Anyway, it's pretty obvious that in this, this Gaussian-like distribution uh, propagates in a kind of semi-classical way um, where you really can't ask about its position or momentum. So the PEL requires it, though, to jump about. So even though the bubble propagates classic, semi-classically, the bubble itself also jumps about um, because it interacts with the densely arrayed 20 groups in our analog of the Dirac C. And it's really not our analog of the Dirac C as much as it is something even more primordial, which is a Planck scale quantum foam of energy potentials, where the energy potentials are far more standardized and of a smaller species set than the infinity of different reg calculus curvature values that can be encoded in a quantum spin foam. So in other words, the PEL demands that it interact with these virtual objects or energy potentials, and also there will be statistical blips of objects that have moments of coherence and pattern uh, in the background noise, and it will interact with all of that. And ordinary dense, in ordinary dense energy spaces, like here, in, in a, where you're not in vacuum, then of course uh, free electrons will rapidly change their T over P and their direction. So these Gaussian-like uh, bubbles will constantly uh, change their pathway in an ordinary uh, physical space. So they constantly lose their, their constant rate of 20 group savings temporarily each time uh, they change their T over P and direction. So they're experiencing momentary quanta of inertia all the time. So this is very important. The, relative, the relatively short drop-off in 20 group savings, both in both directions of time along the clock's world line, allows inertia, which equals the loss of the constant rate, the ideal rate, of 20 group savings per clock cycle. It causes that inertia after a quantum of acceleration to end very quickly after some sequence of uh, quanta of acceleration occur. To understand why inertia occurs, you have to understand that if you chop off its retarded and advanced wave function or association with the past part of its former uh, world line along a certain direction at a certain ratio of T over P, which is this idea of an electron in vacuum moving at a constant rate along a constant direction. So because the t constant rate of savings is dependent on Fong having her version here, 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 and here, have this enjoyment of a constant rate of 20 group savings, computational savings, that bubble will be in its most economical computational state moving at a constant rate and direction uh, in this, in this quasi-particle formalism. And if you interrupt that, you, you interrupt her former association with the advanced and retarded uh, portions of her, of her um, Gaussian-like distribution. And she has to start over so that at Planck time one, after the quantum of acceleration occurs, Fong has not yet had enough time to build up this Gaussian distribution. But after only a few Planck moments, it builds up again relatively quick. So you can see, uh, if you think it through, that what I am predicting with this toy model is that during these brief microscopic moments in time, the intrinsic mass lowers drastically because the mass is the constant rate of frame savings. And while you lose the constant rate of frame savings, you will experience drag, resistance. So 
When starting a new world line, it will take a few plank moments or frames to build up its former constant rate of 20 group savings. Specifically, inertia will, will reduce its intrinsic mass temporarily until inertia fades in discrete frames to enjoy the full potential of 20 group savings within the forward and backward in time length of the Gaussian-like distribution bubble that has a length or should have a length equal to the Compton wavelength. That is, if you start a new empire wave world line, and in this case I do not mean the world line where the particles path as it zigzags on a random walk. I'm talking about this, more, this notion of a, of a particle at a constant rate of t over p and, and direction. So, if you start a new empire uh, wave world line at a new t0, you have uh, very little ahead of you or behind you in terms of 20 group savings. So you're going to uh, drag in a sense. It's gonna, you're, you're gonna, the system will have to use more, um, more of this universal time or universal energy or frames, the, these actions that, uh, that animate everything. This is kind of like where, where, uh, where Stephen Hawking said, before I die, I want to know, I don't think he found out before he died, but he said, I want to know before I die, what is it that breathes fire into the equations, you know? What is it that animates everything? So you'll have a little more of, the, of your recovery of your constant rate of 20 group savings per clock cycle at, uh, at T1 and then T2, and then it'll quickly regain the full strength and inertia will fade to zero as you build up a sufficient 20 group savings, not sufficient, the ideal rate of 20 group savings along the newly born young world line of your empire wave to regain your former constant rate of 20 group savings, your former intrinsic mass. At this time, inertia ends and its intrinsic mass is regained. So mass, therefore, is the potential to lose AB equals P solutions or 20 group savings. There are three fundamental clock patterns, each with a different constant rate of 20 group savings or intrinsic mass. And you may be asking, well, if we're all moving with very similar T over P ratios in some similar uh, reference, inertial reference frames as we move through the universe together here on Earth, then why would us having slower or faster internal clocks, this abstract idea, why would that mean that time is moving slower or faster for us in any reasonable sense? Because that sounds very abstract. All right. Well, to comment on that, we can ask, well, what is time? Time for you or for a microbe or anything else is the rate over some quantity of universal frames with which you interact with everything around you and within you. For some H2O molecule flowing in water, the rate of its interactions is heavily dependent upon the cycles per n frames of this rich electromagnetic field around it, as well as its spin, its dipole direction changes, etc. These, the, these are the aspects of the particle that cause interaction with other particles. So all of these changes and the clock motion itself are more complicated than the forward propagation pattern because they relate more to a two-sphere whereas the forward propagation relates to a one-sphere. They are primary interaction values. That part of the, the part of the empire field uh, defined by the percentage of your frames dedicated to the T portion is the part of the empire. Like, in other words, I can be a clock and, and relative to my forward steps over N frames in my animation, I can literally be doing, you know, in this formalism, you know, 10, 10 to the 35 more clock cycles over N frames than forward prop propagation steps. And indeed, most, um, most, most uh, fermions in the universe, excluding neutrinos, are moving at a very, um, very finite uh, fractions of the speed of light, so therefore have most of the universal frames pumped in invisibly to clock cycles. But it's not 
invisible. It is what generates the interactions, the van der Waals forces, all of the complexity uh, that we would use to recognize change in, as it builds up to the macro scale changes through chemistry and so on. But think of all those things as coming out, That's that, that portion of this field that generates the interactions. Think of it coming out from this, um, this particle that's moving a significant fraction of its frames through, through, uh, through time and not space. Think of it like a dense, complexly ordered, uh, layered and twisting kind of spray of interaction possibility or change possibility from the particles in your body uh, moving through space. Smear this spray of change or interaction potential from that component the, three, the two sphere component of this wave form, of this pilot wave, smear it more sparsely across more and more distance or volume, and you will simply reduce the amount of interaction or really action and change that you observe for that particle over this same fixed quantity of frames, right? So we can take a thousand frames and we build an interaction that causes it to interact with other particles. And if we put 99% of its frames into the interaction field, which is its EM field, and the portion of the, of the quantum field that defines its spin and other interaction values, uh, then we, over our thousand frame animation, we will get more interaction. If we spend 99% of our frames expressing the, t, the, the P portion, the propagation portion, then we will get the opposite. Over the same thousand frames, we will have less interaction, but we get a, a trade-off. We get the particle to take a tour through more of the universe and observation of the particles and the things around it. So it propagates more through space. Propagation through time is, is driving interaction, or what we call our experience of local time, which builds up from QED through chemistry and on up to, to interactions like us watching the clock, you know? So put differently, where T averages N for a clock particle or system of such particles, it interacts uh, more over some quantity of, uh, some fixed quantity of AB equals P solutions than a particle or system uh, with average uh, T, that, that is frames dedicated to the internal clock, uh, that's, that's less than, that, than this value N here. That's less than this N where that N is, is pumping more of its frame uh, actions into internal clock time. So you'll invest your change into more change through space in that case, and less particle interaction change, which is the change that we define as as local time for a given uh, system in some inertial frame of reference. But of course, you would not notice that change if you're trapped in the system. Um, you would not notice it that it's slower or faster and you'd have no possible way to ascertain your personal, you and your friends common similar inertial frames of reference. How could you? Your very mind would process information and observe slower and everything moving with you at a similar inertial frame of reference or T over P ratio would seem also normal no matter what all of your all of your T over P ratios as a similar group are. One fact is that the clock you measure uh, the speed of light with would be in your inertial reference frame possessing a very similar average T over P ratio. So Whatever your T over P ratio, you'll always have clocks that give you the same measure for a photon moving away from you in vacuum, hitting a mirror and returning to your detector and measured by your slow or fast clocks. So this model, it's only a toy model, but the toyness of it is in full agreement with this particularly important uh, aspect of special relativity, with one serious exception. Ontologically, there is a real universal frame rate and a real substructure or background to space. The T over P ratio is also real and absolute and not relativistic. It just gives you relativistic measurements if you're trapped in the system. 
You just can't measure it from within the system unless we think about it more and devise an experimental prediction. I'm not saying it's impossible, but the model is just a baby right now. So next, I would like to talk about fundamental things in our toy model. I'll discuss energy, quote unquote, the electromagnetic field, the pilot wave, and um, some constants and measures. We've discussed the pilot wave and how it will correspond to quantum mechanics if the clock pattern we choose is correct. And we've discussed how the EM field is this pilot wave, but that depends on what one even means by EM field. If we mean Maxwell's EM field, this is not true. If we mean a QED or a quantum field theoretic EM view that can correspond to strong quantum correlation probabilities, such as entanglement, quantum damping, etc., uh, then, uh, then it should be equal to our pilot wave model. So to be more accurate, we would have to say that this empire wave field that we're seeking is a discretized space-time emergence theory analog of that that has some nice correlations to QED and similarities to certain discrete space-time forms of quantum field theory, meaning there should be a large set of models that are not our model that are making equally good predictions as, as our model. So the truth is that our emerging model is not directly comparable to any theory out there that I know of. It's either revolutionary or it's totally wrong. First, let us talk about quote-unquote energy. I'm following a stair-step process here, and I'm allowing only 20 group savings guided by the PEL to force my hand. But it's a general notion, and we don't have to use 20 groups. Okay, I'm, I'm using them because of stuff I showed you earlier about the 600 cells being fundamental transformations of the Gossett polytope in E8 and the fact that the Cartesians of the 600 cell are equal to the Cartesians of the 24 cell 5 compound and how each of those five 24 cells maps to the projection which is a cube octahedron and those map to the five cube octahedra defining these 60 points and so I feel that if we use 20 groups, we have all the group theoretic machinery that we need, particularly, you know, the, the fundamental groups for um, quantum chromodynamics and, um, and the other, other must-have things from other theories that are absolutely correct insofar as they go, insofar as their gauge symmetry equations. All right, to discuss potential and kinetic energy, we must review our 20 group savings concept and understand things like quote unquote work within the context of uh, this model. So energy, let us say for now, is the potential uh, to do work, to accelerate something as acted upon by a force, okay? That we can all agree on. For example, the potential energy around a clock is its landscape of gravitational and electromagnetic energy wells, uh, and they all have the potential to do work on the clock, the fermion. They have uh, the potential to accelerate it, to change its T over P ratio and its direction. Kinetic energy is also poten has potential to do work. The kinetic energy of a clock allows it to do work on other clocks, and on itself, because if it does work on other clocks with its kinetic energy, it's going to be doing work on itself. And it has the uh, ability to interact with uh, the empire waves, uh, and as well as, uh, as well as empire waves which have been liberated from association with a clock, which are photonic wave packets. And I'll show you some pretty illustrations on how the empire wave, when, it, when you truncate the world line of a particle moving at a constant rate uh, through space along the same direction, and you chop it with a deflection event, deceleration of, an acceleration event, you send it on a new world line, its empire wave continues propagating, but it is a very different object now. Because prior to that, the empire, the empire wave was this guy. But when it's no, in other words, it's closely associated with a clock, its master, and it guides its master. 
But once you liberate it from its clock by starting over again and building up a new Gaussian-like distribution, the former empire wave is a particle. It just is a particle without a clock. But it's also made of 20 groups in a coherent pattern because it was always coherent the way it was born from a coherent clock pattern. So that will interact. That dense sheets over the integrated time domain on the ruled surfaces, that's going to have rich interaction potential to change the T over P and the directions of other clocks. Gravity is based on, uh, on 20 group savings. But I will not get uh, into it much detail today. Actually, I'll, I will a little bit later. Um, so work can only be done on objects with mass, clocks. Can't do work on anything else in this model. Our three shapes, or fundamental pilot waves plus clock systems, are what I could call fundamental masses, because they each have different, unique, constant rates of 20 group savings if you allow them to cycle without changing their T over P ratios, which invariably changes their directions. This interruption to a particle clock's world line causes it to temporarily lose its constant rate of 20 group savings. <clears throat> in other words, the pattern's intrinsic mass will kick in. Inertia will occur as work is being done. To the change of T over P and direction from its former rate of 20 group savings disconnects the former electromagnetic field world line from its clock as it continues on along the same direction as the old world line of its clock, now orphaned from its clock and left alone to move at sea in the universe, drifting a boat without a captain, drifting until it interacts and participates with messing with some other clock. As discussed at Planck time one and two and other short distances, the breaking of the old world line is such that the new world line of the clock has not yet built up the constant rate of 20 group savings that defines its intrinsic mass, such that there is a negative delta to its mass during inertia and lasting for a very few Planck moments thereafter. This, constants, uh, this constant itself is a ratio of these two things. The quantity of particle T and P steps to complete one cycle, which call A, and the ideal quantity of 20 group or frame savings over a cycle. So it's kind of like what we talked about before, where we counted the number of steps in that pentagram pattern and said, well, this is what you would have to have if you had no savings. And then this is what you do have when you have the savings. So it's just the ratio of those two numbers is the particle's intrinsic mass. So realize that different clocks have different numbers of steps. So the mass is not about, you know, here's a clock. So this is a, good, this is a great example of a clock because we don't know how, how the pattern should be. We don't know how many shells it is. We don't know if it acts as a Eulerian or Hamiltonian circuit just on the surface of some convex hull or if it goes in, you know, like the way my 2D one on the pentagon went in and out and in and out to form up an internal pentagram. We don't know, but it, it, it is that ratio, not necessarily the clock steps. But of course, you, one would think, but not in all cases, well, if I have a really big clock, clearly I have a lot more opportunities for 20 group savings. But it's going to come down to the real geometry and the way these empires will work. Because there can very well, in principle, be a case where you have two clocks that have the same number of steps, but they're different patterns, they're different, different circuits. And in one, you just simply have more frame savings than in the other, and yet they could be the same. But I expect for the neutrino clock and the electron clock or the quark clock, I expect there to be pretty radically different qualities to the, to the circuit pathways of, of, these, of these patterns that we're describing related to frame savings. So accordingly, the ratio of A over B is the clock species intrinsic mass, or M, 
<clears throat> and I'll explain uh, why. There is a finite set of t over p ratios in this model um, along a scale that spans on a golden ratio power series from the electron at rest to an electron at C. And they're also discrete vibratory modes. It's really kind of trivially easy to see why these patterns, these, these objects can only follow the scaling factor in our discretized system. So each of, the, each of the discrete set of ratios defines the allowed wavelengths of the photons made of 20 groups that are emitted from clocks when they change world lines. So its ideal constant rate of A, B equals P solution space savings or 20 group savings. For these slides, I'll write it as that symbol. So let's say that's that's this ideal rate, and you'd have a different one for each fundamental mass. So it would be a constant like this for each uh, fundamental mass, which we could denote something like that. Again, during the acceleration event, the clock's world line in both directions of time is broken such that the 20 group savings over some number of frames is, during the quanta of acceleration is less than the intrinsic ideal mass for, the, for each particle. And this value goes to some quantity of inertia. So we can quantize inertia, quantize mass, quantize acceleration. So some, some quantity of, of quanta of inertia, which is temporary loss of 20 group savings, which, which would be different for each of the three fundamental masses. Now, because the 20 group savings drop severely with distance in both directions of time along the pilot wave's world line, it regains its former magnitude of 20 group savings, this very quickly after some sequence of quanta of acceleration end. When it regains this former Gaussian-like distribution of its empire wave of 20 group savings, I inertia is then canceled and the negative delta to the ma intrinsic mass goes back to intrinsic mass. Resistance to change or loss of 20 group savings in the clock's T and P steps fades very quickly over a few frames as negative delta to the intrinsic mass goes back to intrinsic mass and work stops occurring. Of course, this constant rate of 20 group savings with this symbol that I'm using is its mass. This is electron mass with the man-made arbitrary values such as SI units removed. But I'll call it M, that symbol, for a few slides. M is quantized because some minimum acceleration event is capable of some minimum quantity of inertia, where the minimum quantity is the quantum of inertia. Each associated with one of these masses here. I have no good reason why I, I use the C symbol and <laughs> those frames and then I switch to the M. There's utterly no reason. There are only two logical ways for me to quantize inertia and mass. We can do it for each of the three fundamental clock masses where each have a different integer quantity of 20 group savings or, frame or computational savings during one complete clock cycle. Got to go all the way through it. Or I could decompose that. I can decompose those integer values into just one thing. Single 20 group position savings. That's the irreducible level. That's the unification level. This then reduces to the following. A quantum of mass, MQ, equals the potential for a loss of 20 group savings. You have to have the potential to lose it, which means you have to have it in order to lose it. Losing it is inertia. And losing it is work. So. The quantum of inertia equals the loss of a 20 group savings. So this is a 20 group savings. This is a loss of a 20 group savings. So this always converts to this. And a quantum of acceleration is what causes, is the causing of a gain or a loss of 20 group savings, generating the minimal possible delta to a, a clock's T over P ratio. And then C 
would be an ordered set of two state selections defining the minimal connection length LP. Right? That's the minimal definition. You can't define C as just one thing. You have to say I need two or more things to have my notion of universal time and my distance such that our value, well, anyway, we'll get to that more. All right, so because the quantum of mass equals the potential for a loss of 20 group savings, um, completes a connection, right, graph theoretically. So think about these patterns of these quasi-particles is you basically, you know, you're adding one object, you have one object, and then you just add another object, okay, in, on this rule-based system related to all the way back up to E8. And what are you creating? You're creating one simplices, lengths, graph connections. And so because a quantum of mass equals the potential for a loss of a 20 group savings, one 20 group savings in the ultimate reduction, you're talking about connections, saving connections, graph theoretically, right? or adding additional step values of the Planck length, which our Planck length is phi. So then, in this sense, a quantum of mass is a connection. The connection value is a graph connection. It's a distance for us. But mathematically, the whole model works without, without distance. You can call all the values abstract, just numbers, and the math, the computation, everything works out. It is simply a convenient theory to say that distance is real because I observe it, you know, we measure it. So, and a quantum of inertia or loss of a 20 group savings would be negative connection, negative phi. Consider a clock with a T over P ratio of T equals 1 and P equals 0 to model an electron at rest. Note that here we have a quantum of clock time defined as one complete clock cycle, which would require some quantity of connections or frames. Its rest mass will be a constant rate of 20 group savings per cycle, which is n frames. In other words, this clock possesses the potential to have a savings interruption of up to n a, b equals p solutions or 20 group savings per cycle. That is, is, that's is, that is exactly its intrinsic mass. So let us symbolize our new quantum of internal clock time as a time quanta. <laughs> the universal frame rate is something different. It's almost unappealing to me to call it universal time because it's not a clock. And I spent so much time talking about clocks and time. It's really not universal time. It's an ordered set. That's all that we can safely say. Anyway, so this is a constant, uh, but over n ordered sets of a, b equals p solutions, this constant, which is our quantum of internal time, is a coefficient with a second coefficient, which is its t over p ratio, which defines the absolute and non-relativistic ratio of clock cycles to n a b equals p solutions where n is sufficiently large. Let me translate that. I don't have a good reason right now to expect that the constant rate of frame savings for an electron at rest in this view should necessarily be the same as the constant rate over each clock cycle for an electron moving at 50% of c. And I'm going to play it safe and presume that it doesn't. So we have this special value at t equals 1, p equals 0, the electron at rest. So we have a quantum of clock time defined as a complete clock cycle, which requires some number of these Planck distance connection actions defined by some quantity of a, b equals p solutions in the algebraic space, where the Planck length, is, or LP, is the golden ratio. That's what we've established so far. So where n uh, is the quantity of Planck distance jumps that composite to form some clock cycle, full cycle, which is a quantum of internal time, then we, then we have 
the internal clock time, TQ, divided by the number of frames, or A over B, uh, AB a, a, equals P solutions, equals, once again, uh, the Planck length, which, of course, is, again, the golden ratio. So here, the canonical notion of time breaks down because the relationship between the sequence of TQ over N equals LP um, A, which is one value, and, and TQN equals LP B, is an integer multiple of the fundamental distance, phi. So in discussing energy and some constants, I have jumped around a lot so far because a whole new set of first principles ideas has to be sort of memorized, learned, questioned, criticized, and sort of then worked with as, work, as a working set of ideas. And we're not uh, very conversant in it. I'm barely learning to be conversant in it with myself at this point. It's very, it's brand, this is all brand new for me. So we have defined M and the Planck time and length from first principles. Of course, C is time over length where we use universal time as frames or shells. Oh, yeah, I, L over T. I sh I, I, yeah, so, it's, so C here is the ratio of length over time, where we use universal time as uh, frames or shells with a distance phi. So the distance between shells is phi. And uh, where L uh, equals phi, such that phi over phi becomes our quantum of uh, C, uh, which is 1. We have also derived a quantum of inertia and a quantum of acceleration. We have made a prediction from first principles that at very short time scales after the acceleration event, a particle's intrinsic mass has negative delta. Perhaps the first principle's definition of energy is apparent to you so far. If not, here it goes. Energy is order. Because only orderly patterns of A, B equals P solutions and their representations in some local area of the physical space have the ability um, to change the T over P ratio and the directions of clocks. The clocks ride these patterns. They're enormous. It's like starlings in Europe, these sheets of birds in the sky just fluidically moving. These, this system with the frame rate of 10 to the 44 per second and this microscopic scale at the Planck scale and these clocks that spray out in incredibly large numbers of 20 group savings in these empires, um, the meaningful energy is the order in those, in that, in that quantum waveform field that's generated by clocks. The noise at the quantum foam level is far more trivial in terms of its power to meaningfully uh, interact and change the destiny of the world line of the particles. And besides, they're so chaotic that they, they'll change the destiny of the particles over very short time distances and directions that average out to about zero. So the meaningful patterns that don't cancel out an average are the big, smooth gravitational patterns and the big, smooth electromagnetic patterns. So virtual photons in our version of Dirac C will interact with clocks, but not in a meaningful way compared to the enormous and coherently arranged orphaned empire waves of 20 groups. Photon wave packets that are created from T over P ratio changes that equal clock acceleration events, orphaned empire waves. They're orderly, so quantum noise is not orderly. We have quantum noise in our model. It is, it is the wave packets that are orderly, and it is the EM fields, the empire waves, uh, uh, that are still associated with their clocks, which are orderly. 
So the coherently arranged non-orphaned empire waves of 20 groups that are uh, swirling around clocks also interact to change the t over p and direction of other clocks. All three of these forms of 20 groups, photons, potentials, form part of the energy landscape that control the probability amplitudes for changes to clocks. And I will explain what I know about the strong force and gravity when we have more time, but it's also very simple and is also based on 20 group savings. And I will also tell you about gravity because this is the slide from the old presentation. So today I'm gonna to show some new slides on gravity. So think of any 20 groups serving as an energy well for a clock. Second, we may be able to deal with this uh, similar to the idea of pressure, right? So I may have made it clear to you in the toy model how attraction occurs, and I may not have made it clear how repulsion would occur. But what if attraction is fundamental and repulsion is not? So maybe it is similar to the idea of pressure, where the lack of 20 group savings is exactly where the particle statistically does not want to be. Let us look again at why energy is quantized. The empire wave field around the clock is discretized into 20 groups. And those drop, those beautiful stri striated patterns, they drop and drop and drop, but they keep going to the end of the universe. A 20 group itself is an energy well. Again, it is a quantum of energy. It's just a little potential. These quanta of energy come in two flavors. The ones that are part of the natural noise in the background, these will interact weakly with a clock in very short time and space scales. And the huge quantities of coherently arranged 20 groups on the ruled surfaces of the substructure of the empire wave itself, especially its own. These will interact with clocks very strongly. This is what happens when a world line is broken abruptly in a clock acceleration event. This could have been going on for a long time. And whatever this guy does, it's what defines this field of 20 groups that goes out. Now this guy is alone. He's got no boss anymore. He can, he's not going to change. As a new world line is born, as the old clock takes on its new life with a new T over P and direction to quickly recover its constant magnitude of intrinsic mass, the empire wave of the previous T over P, its former life, as a you know, the former clock, is truncated and orphaned. So what is the size of this wave packet and why is it that size? Well, by it, uh, by size, I'm meaning the size of its wavelength, for example, and its amplitude. It is relative to the size of the, of the Gaussian light distribution of the 20 group savings near the Compton wavelength scale. These, these Gaussian light distributions will be different for different T over P ratios and, and different for each fundamental clock. And clocks in atomic or orbitals will be different than free electrons and neutrinos. These things are both waves in their total pattern, and they're also particles in their composition of 20 groups. I said energy is order. The order, the quality of order in the AB over P solution space. So it has a lot more energy than, let us say, a virtual photon or a, or a fo or temporary photonic blip in Dirac C in this background noise, or a quantum foam even below that, where something like a single 20 group can be a quantum energy well for one brief moment. Uh, yes, when you say this energy is order, you just have uh, answered the question for Stephen Hawking that you said, what is moving everything? It's this energy. So this energy is quite different from the classical energy E equals mc2, we transform into heat at the end and into entropy. Your energy is a negentropy, which is not conserved, but moves everything. Yeah, but then there's also a universal frame rate. So regardless of, 
regardless of the quality of the order or the level of uh, where you're at in the expansion of the universe, you still have this quite magical, mysterious universal frame rate going. And some of you know my ontology on that, which is the Ouroboros model of cosmology, which is very logically consistent, even if false. But it's, it's, uh, it gives some answer, but I, I doubt Stephen Hawking would have believed it. We got to get this right before we talk about crazy ideas like the self-actualized universe model. How do you check that energy momentum is conserved in the interaction? Uh, how is energy and momentum conserved? And the energy momentum, in the form of momentum. So in this case, in this example, he's assuming some external perturbing force that would have influenced it. So he's not actually showing uh, you know, okay. conservation okay. here. He's okay. assuming okay. some external okay. agent. So, this wave packet is kind of like a ripple that continues, and uh, it's really a chopped off packet of the empire wave. <clears throat> but it's not really an empire wave anymore. Of, this cl of the clock's former world line, this thing has energy because it has order and wavelength, which is equal to the energy and mass of the clock which generated it in the first place. Because this is a highly ordered propagating packet, like a ship without a captain, no longer being propelled as part of a clock plus pilot wave system, because it's made of 20 groups that have a ruled surface over the time domain of universal time or frames, other clocks will strongly interact with it. So just as the electromagnetic field around the clock is energy, 20 groups that can do work, so too are the wave packets that were formerly part of an empire wave plus clock system. These wave packets are defined by the discrete vibratory modes of the clocks that generated them in the first place. The golden ratio power series, which wouldn't look to anyone like that unless they knew the theory behind it because high powers of the golden ratio are are, uh, are approaching integers very fast. So when the waveform is chopped, it has the form of whatever the clock size and T over P ratio was, and those can come only in uh, discrete quanta related to our form of Planck's constant, where there's a minimum. So the wave that was continuous when it was part of a long world line of a clock is now chopped off into a propagating wave packet of ruled surfaces of empires, empire waves. So let us fix our ordered set of frames, in other words, our universal time, for a clock to be the quantity of frames that is necessary to cycle our clock, the electron at rest, only one time. And we don't know that integer, so we'll just call it n. Now, as we know, there are three fundamental dimensionless constants, C, H, and G, from which the other 23 constants can be derived. Strangely, these three relate to one another by, uh, in the Davies and the Rovelli and in Marcello's equation. This is Davies' equation, this is Marcello's, and this is um, Rovelli. So on the right side of the equations, they all are, really, are, are the golden ratio. And in some sense, what this is telling you here is that even though there's a lot of man-made metrics stuffed into all these values, well, it's not a problem because all we're looking at is the dimensionless ratio of these. So it doesn't really matter so much what the values are and the man-made constants. What matters is the ratios of these fundamental things to one another. So the only assumption of Davies was that uh, C and G and classic thermodynamics are true, that is uh, general relativity and uh, thermodynamics, uh, or that Newton's G and uh, special relativities C and general relativities C and G, all of that was assumed to be true in order to get this, 
and classic thermodynamics was assumed to be true, and he gets this. So he assumed entropic theory and general relativity to be true. All right, Rovelli and Amaral assumed C, H, and G, and uh, thermodynamic theory to be true. General relativity, quantum mechanics, and thermodynamics. And so they get the golden ratio on the right side of the equation in a different way, with, different, uh, with, a, with a, an extra assumption that quantum mechanics is true. So, because they are all ratio-based, you can build physics in some sense with any two of the three fundamental constants, uh, such that uh, you can get C by the relationship of G and H, and so on. Okay? To understand how, uh, this paper is pretty good. The number of uh, dimensional constants where they just argue, but I don't think it needs to be argued that you can get any of the three from the other two. Anyway, they point out uh, they point out that C can be reduced to L over T equals Planck length over Planck time, which for us can be seen as um, as P over T, which equals one, because in the shell model, the distance between a 20 groups from shell N to shell M is phi. So we set that, our C, to 1. The force of gravity divided by an adjustment value, G. So G resolves the discrepancy between two different man-made metrics, which are newtons and kilos. So, so G is a sort of fix for this. So again, M is the potential uh, for loss of 20 group savings for a given clock, a given mass. The potential to cause inertia when the ratio of T over P is changed during an acceleration event. Now each addition or savings of a 20 group position is, e is equal to the creation of a connection, right? Graph theoretically. And therefore a length value of LP equals phi geometrically or spatially such that, such that M is equal, may have deleted a slide. So anyway, what this does is this goes to this. So our notion of the force of gravity does not mix two metrics such as newtons and kilos. We use only the golden ratio, which allows us to cast out the resolving function g. To explore first principles reasons why time would relate to gravity and Planck's constant, let us take a, a clock with a t over p, uh, this time where t is 0 and p is 1. So let us presume a minimum advancement step of our connection lengths to be the Planck length and set the Planck length to be phi because that is our basic graph connection magnitude. Then over some quantity of frames, our clock propagates that quantity of frames times the Planck length. So over one frame, it propagates the Planck length. Accordingly, one frame of universal time equals an AB equals P solution equals C, the speed limit, over one frame. So because the length covered over C in one frame is phi, and because the shell model has a shell 1 to shell 2 distance of phi, then we see that the minimum quantum of action, H, is equal to the square of phi, the, uh, phi squared. And we can see that C is what people trapped in local particle clock time exper uh, experience, like us, uh, we would relate that to time because it involves change, it's distant, distance and, and, and the notion of time. Like you, you, would never, you would never be able to say the word time if you didn't use length. I mean, I can't do anything with the word time unless length is implied. All right, the ultimate building block of C, H, and the force of gravity is a one simplex distance value phi. So if we set our tetrahedra at phi, uh, I think when you deflate, you know, when, you, when we talked about deflating the QSN to see how close by deflation we can get to 20 groups where we leave them at the same scale. So we leave the 20 groups the same scale and we keep 
creating the background deflation. If we set the tetrahedral edges to phi, I suspect that maybe there is a solution where they would kiss if you, if you allow this deflation. Whereas I worry that if you set it to one, then maybe you'd have to go to infinity on the deflations before they kiss. But that's something to talk about later. All right, so C is one, H is phi squared, and M is phi, the savings of a connection. So what again is energy, E? Energy is the potential for a 20 group savings, which generates a one simplex connection value of the Planck length. And again, M is the savings, M is the savings of a quanta of distance phi. So let's see how all of this works in real physics, an equation like E equals MC squared. So we can rewrite E equals MC squared, thusly using what we just argued in the slides before, and it solves. Clima, we know that E, e equal MC squared, I mean, it's uh, old in only when gamma, I mean, because actually the actual uh, equation is E equal MC squared gamma, where gamma is the special relativity factor. So, would this imply that, of course, uh, you are putting gamma equal one? I mean, uh, it's of a, a particular uh, uh, speed, no? Because gamma is equal one. Uh, so, um, can you generalize this treatment when the speed uh, is less than c? No, I think there's a lot of things like 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 the constants that Einstein had to come up with that you know one of which he didn't like and that turned out to be good later. There's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of physical things that, that this toy model here is not uh, explaining and that what you bring up now is one of them. So what I'm convinced of is that my, my ideas right now are broad stroke and if we can get them into non-physically realistic simulations just to see there's going to be emergent, uh, emergent numbers, let's call it, that come out of these simulations. And I don't know what all of those are like now, but there's going to be some other things that, that come out of, of these first principles and this first principles type of clock model. So yeah, I, I don't have a good answer for that at this time. So I hope the story at least is getting more clear than it was before we started the story and even more clear for those of you who heard uh, some of the story um, the other day. No, excuse me, I was going back to that point. Wasn't that the rest frame the rest energy? Yeah. Oh, what, wasn't it wasn't what? that the rest frame energy? I thought it was that. Yes, so that was the electron at rest. Right. Yeah, but Not the electron, it's not actually the Planck mass. No. Uh, yeah, I mean, but we were considering a, a mass at rest with... When gamma is equal to 1, is the rest frame. Uh, right, right. Uh, yeah, so th what Richard said is, I had reduced it by that point where I was not taking the full clock cycle, and then I had just reduced the... You know, you can decompose the clock cycle savings of 20 groups. Say you have a 50 full clock cycle, you save 50 frames, 50 20 groups but you can just reduce all the way down to just one 20 group savings. And then you're not really talking about mass exactly anymore because that 20 group savings can also, you know, serve in other types of patterns. Yeah, yeah just about radius. So in the main, most of the last slide, we write H, but uh, it's a reduced uh, H, bar, H bar. There is no H bar in PowerPoint. So we try to simplify, but after it gives some confusion. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I haven't done H bar yet, Ray. Every, every, no, no, my, so far I have defined only the minimum quantum of action, H, not H bar. H bar can come in, ah, but, but when it's related to the Planck measurement that we have in our unit, it's H bar. We have an H bar, but I'm saying you can do you can do physics in many it, there, well. 
there is an H. <laughs> and of course, the H bar is just that divided by the circle. Uh, but the, the fundamental thing is to understand H first, and, and then we would understand the cases in which we would have to use H bar. But, it, but earlier, when I just showed the H just as an action, uh, it would be an action you know, over, a, over a length as the simplest case. But you could the concept is h, but the value in our unit is uh, phi two is h bar. Okay. Wh what in our okay? We'll talk about it later, because because then there would be an h. Our units would have an h and an h bar. Yeah, that's why uh, after that there was some confusion. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, everybody good? Is it, how's the temperature? You want it colder? Maybe a little bit. Okay. All right, so these guys prop can propagate forward in these minimal steps that can be no less than phi. They create complicated uh, discretized fields uh, that are made of, uh, of these steps. So the, the really interesting stuff is in the constellations of stars that form these patterns uh, like these empire waves. Uh, but at the end of the day, they're all decomposable kind of in a graph theoretic sense, into these steps of the fundamental length in, in, in the math. The fields are made of energy because they contain orderly patterns of steps of phi, where each position of a 20 group is a Planck scale energy potential. When the clocks abandon these fields of 20 groups or steps of phi to chase after a different pathway in this 20 group energy landscape, the empire waves of the previous world line of the clock is abandoned to propagate at C and provide 20 group computational savings to other clocks uh, that it might encounter. With man-made metrics, the correlation between CHG and the Planck length and Planck time looks like this, right? With the man-made metrics plugged in. Without the man-made metrics, the correlation between CH, Planck length, and Planck time looks like this, where we don't need the resolving function G. From this, we get The first slide, there is a correct, correct value because yeah. we had some typos before. So, typo this should be, this, should, this should be phi, phi squared. And actually, that E is not something that we get at some another thing we chose. That's Epsilon. 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 So uh, phi squared over 2 pi equals this value here. Uh, it's not 2 pi, it's uh, 380. Huh? It's 360. It's 2 pi expressed in degree numerical value. You said this is representing the angle 2 pi. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Value You're right. In degree. We talked about that before, and I didn't change it because I added all the other stuff. So then Boltzmann's formalism, we set Kb equal to phi such that theta equals the Planck temperature 1. And then Rovelli's equation will become S is greater than phi squared minus phi over 4. And the birkenstein hawking equation also becomes S greater than 1 quarter. And um, this is a more accurate table of our, of our values. So here would be the constants, and here would be the units. This is actually in the third row. Here? Yeah. Well, 
I don't know what is H because there is no two bar. There is no two bar. No, no, no. It's supposed to be H bar. H bar is what's equal to phi squared, not H. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In plant tunic, it's H bar equals 1. By yes. definition of plant tunic, in all you need is phi 2 instead. So a few slides on this. This won't be a, uh, we won't be a lot longer. But I want to talk about the curvature of gravity and what gravity might be in emergence theory. As discussed um, earlier, our physics is about ordered sets of ordered sets where each state selection on a base possibility space is an ordered set and where two or more such sets is an ordered set of ordered sets that defines the flow of change on this idea of a base possibility set, which is the superposition of all ordered sets in the ordered set of ordered sets. The objects that we're working with in 3D are 20 groups for now. A single 20 group is a quantum energy well, or a quantum of gravity, if you like. Gravity and the other forces and particles are made of 20 groups. So this is a proposed unification of forces and particles where the concentration of 20 group savings defines the strength of the forces and where the patterns over time in space define the evolving shapes and positions of the particles made of 20 group quanta of gravity, the, the shapes of their, di of their dynamical trajectories. So we may also look at these quanta of gravity graph theoretically as connections of a length. So we denote this as distance phi to some power where n would always be an integer uh, and, and so, such that it would be the golden ratio power series um, which correlates to the notion in quasi-crystal math of inflation and deflation. The minimal distance mapped to n equals 1 uh, is the Planck length, which for us will be phi at, phi, at phi to the power 1 in this golden ratio power series in this fractal cosmology. And we will move forward with the shell model for now because no one has demonstrated why it will not work and it might work. Moving forward means we'll just try to see if it can work, <laughs> right? Um, but I, I think that there needs to be a lot of discussion on the shell model. My model for gravity currently requires the shell model. My motivation is that my model for gravity and spatial expansion uh, requires the shell model. Other, other than that, I have to start with a different idea. And I'll use the notion of ordered sets again to simplify a flow or pressure model for gravity today. So this is an ordered set of shells. So you can just kind of think of this as little segments on some vast set of universal shells. So I've just taken a little chunk of that. So. So, so this is the same. So the point is, this is the same coordinate as this. Okay, it's like a video. You're playing a video. If a red dot shows up in the left, okay. The red state, the red state selections represent 20 groups here. The density of 20 groups over frames or shells here is 33 percent. We have a homogeneity quality here of perfectly homogeneous density, where we're not giving one coordinate any extra preferential treatment. We also have a probability of measurement value. The probability for measuring a 20 group at any randomly selected shell or frame of time or change is 33% and is equal along all discrete quanta of the space being considered that one would measure. This is a non-homogeneous density distribution over n shells or frames. The probability for measuring a 20 group at coordinate x1 equals 1, with the, or, with the others all being 0. So we have a 100% probability of measuring 
at this x1 coordinate. The density distribution of 20 groups in the shell model defines higher quantum gravity probabilities to measure particles at those higher densities in order to express their patterns, their clock patterns or, or other patterns, and to obey uh, the PEL. That is, the density distribution maps to probability amplitudes for measurements and will cause particles to accelerate and change direction in order to fill those positions to save frames. So the, the, sh the frame, the order over time is key. So when a massive clock changes its T over P ratio and direction in a manner that causes it to temporarily reduce its constant rate of 20 group savings, then of course inertia occurs. When it falls into a sufficiently correlated and dense pattern of 20 group savings that is not part of its empire wave, it can experience more AB equals P savings than the savings that it, that it lost by changing its direction and T over P ratio. For example, if you fall into, if a particle falls into a gravity potential and we're thinking these same principles are what's making it happen, then although it accelerates, changes, has, changes it loses its, in, its intrinsic trit savings, but it gains it gains savings by falling into the density of, tr of 20 group savings, and so it does not experience inertia. And this model would predict th that something like this happens, might happen, when it falls into a, an electromagnetic potential, but maybe not, because it has to be the same. In other words, it has to be, you can't save more you, you, it should be a one-for-one one approximate replacement of the 20 group savings for, for the notion of this idea of weightlessness or lack of, of inertia to occur. And so I don't know what it would be on the EM potentials, but I do know that if it's a repulsive thing, that there really will be a true net loss of, of the constant rate of 20 group savings that's not compensated. And in those cases, there should be the experience of inertia, right? So for example, when I get pushed by Ahmed, it's charge repulsions, not 20 group savings that are doing that. So I am now having all my particles having to change their T over P and temporarily experience inertia you know, suffer that loss of efficiency. So I will feel weight, I feel G-forces, right? Clee, uh, would you define, uh, I mean, I'm thinking about uh, what would be a black hole in this context. So a black hole would be the highest possible density of 20 yeah. group savings. So uh, you should find some, I mean, some bound, because of course, uh, uh, due to the discrete structure, I would say that there is some bound to I this have density. That coming up in a couple slides, okay. it's not the highest density. Uh, it's okay. It's related to the highest density of twenty group savings, but it's also related to the highest density of clocks. How close can you pack clocks? What's the size of these clocks? Are these if the, these clocks are Planck scale type objects? They're bigger than the Planck length, but we don't know how big they are, but they're small. And they're not dimensionless points. So they're not gonna, they're not gonna pack into uh, a singularity. It's gonna be more like the singularity in, um, quant in loop quantum gravity. Uh, I shouldn't call it a singularity, I will call it a limit. So in loop quantum gravity, a lot of clocks, particles can fall into uh, a black hole and it's a non, it's, it's a, it's a non-zero size and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger the more mass that falls into it, but it's remarkably small. So there's um, these charge fields around these electron clocks in this model. Uh, clearly, they are, they, they, they are, they do not come very close together, right? But how close can they get together? And if they get very close together, you know, can they uh, sort of um, end up saving trits in a sort of superposition, a kind of BEC type of material, and how dense can that get? And that should be your, your analog of a black hole. Yeah, exactly. All right. 
All right, did I read this slide? So when it falls into, into a sufficiently correlated and dense pattern of 20 group savings that is not part of its empire wave, uh, then it can experience more a, okay, so I said that. All right, so in this case, it will accelerate without experiencing inertia. 20 groups are quanta of energy that come in more than one class, including 20 groups as part of empire waves of clocks. Those would be the ones that you would call virtual photons in an EM field. And then 20 groups as wave packets that are cut off from clocks and are solo. And uh, they have whatever the uh, wavelength and, en and energy is of the clock, the clock's energy at the time it, it cut them off to be orphaned. And then 20 groups as part of the general noise of the background. And then 20 groups as packets that were not generated by being cut off from clocks, unless this is not possible. So either, either wave packets can form in this model without being orphaned at some point in the history of the universe from a fermion, or they can. Now, I will tell you that so far, I'm going very deductively, very, very slow and cautiously. At this moment, my, my model tells me that all photons of, of at least a certain class of these ripples in space that don't have clock, some certain class of them, a special class, are from clocks, right? And you, don't, you can never know how long ago it came from that clock because they can keep going. So, so I don't so far have any picture yet of how this wave packet forms without being orphaned from a clock. So I was happy to hear Alessio and Piero tell me that, that experimental evidence does not require me at this point, and other models that are uh, rigorous don't require um, me to assume that there are primordial photons that did not originate at one point in their history from uh, fermions, from a, a fermion clock. All right, and 20 groups that are uh, emperors. So you got the emperor 20 group is a very special animal because all, those, all these categories here, right, I didn't imply that these are necessarily emperors because to be part of a clock, you don't have to be an emperor. You can be in the empire. All right, so the 20 groups that are part of the noisy background are the most numerous of all five of those classes. The background noise of all areas of vacuum space in QSN animations are empire structures connected to every single clock and photon packet in the entire universe. So why is gravity 39 orders of magnitude weaker than our proposed model for empire waves or electromagnetic fields? <clears throat> and why is it only attractive? And why does the curvature model of Einstein work so well? Why does a particular synthesis of quantum mechanics and general relativity called space-time superfluid theory, theory model gravity so well? And why is it true that the cosmolo cosmological constant is essentially a stress energy tensor with P equals to negative P possessing a negative pressure? Rho, I mean, rho, rho, sorry. Yeah. So you see the sentence, right? Why, why is rho equal to negative rho possessing a negative pressure which deforms the Minkowski space into a de Sitter space? How do we recover any of these ideas related to general relativity in our thinking? Now to answer these questions, let us presume all systems in the universe are evolving off equilibrium systems that rotate and translate. You don't have to agree with me, but you can agree that most are. We can agree that, that most, we can agree that all, we might agree that all or most black holes are rotating due to the asymmetry of the, of the boundary and the Hawking radiation. We can agree that all, all, all asteroids are rotating. We can agree that all H2O molecules in your bloodstream are rotating and translating, that there should be nothing which is not both translating and rotating, that there can be realistically in a finite universe, no electron at rest, no nothing at rest. 
that everything is rotating and translating. Now, just play along with that and let's see where that goes. So everything correlates to the reduction of the equations of abstract fluids as patterns that combine translation and rotation. So if I were trying to explain a very general principle of the mathematical idea of a generalized frictionless fluid to, to my wife, right? If I were just trying to conceptualize it, I would say it's all of the various complicated combinations of mul many things rotating and translating. And this is the deepest way to think about waveform in general and the deepest way when you have multiple rotators and translators to think about a generalized notion of a kind of mathematical fluid without friction. All right, Navier-Stokes equations combine the notion of mass in Newton's mechanics with the rotation and translation-based equations of generalized fluids. Now, phason quasiparticle behavior in 3D quasicrystals can be equally modeled using Navier-Stokes equations or the more abstract cut and project method from higher dimension. So soften your gaze a little bit like you're hearing a story and stay very conceptual while I paint a story for you. As usual, it's a story of the things that I visualize and the things that I think through logically. Because I think and think and then I visualize and visualize and I just go back and forth. Now the density explanation to the right over here is overly simplified, of course. You must try to imagine how this density gradient of 20 groups is involved with rotation and translation combinatorics flow, some generalized notion of off-equilibrium systems. The fluid-like off-equilibrium density flow, so I'm going to be painting a picture of density flow for you, of this density flow that evolves like a f in fluid-like ways of the background noise. I suspect it is a fluidic pattern because all the masses that define the flow of gravity in space are rotating and translating, right? I mean, if you take point particles as fundamental masses and you imagine that they can just go through flat space in a straight line, okay, then they're not. They're, they're always translating. But if, the, if, the, if, they're, if, if it's really a constellation of point particles, like in the Salam and Pati notion from the 1970s of physically realistic sounding prion particles which are themselves small constellations of dimensionless points that have internal substructure and more interesting things you can do that is ours is a kind of in some ways more sophisticated version than theirs theirs is rigorously worked out ours is not and yet ours has more sophisticated concepts from this quasi crystal math so clearly, all masses in the universe, even if you go all the way down to our fundamental clock, are patterns of rotation and translation, putting, spraying out these discretized fields defined by rotation and translation, kind of like vortices. The reference frame that you are taking is, is, is what? The, the, the initial point where everything evolved from? No, right now I'm just taking um, the idea of the clocks. So the clocks. You need to have a reference frame to talk about translations and rotations. Uh, oh, so, uh, what, so what yes. So we're saying that there that uh, Einstein's presumption of uh, non-absolute ratio of t over p and non-absolute um, motion are um, are false, and that the explanation for the invariance of the measurement of c is explained as we explained it and that there is a background, there is a universal discretized frame rate, so there really is absolute things here in this model. So, so, th so the patterns at, at the small scale, they're, they're rotating, the fermions, there are these clock patterns, they translate and rotate, and their complicated empire wave structures are, are also ro rotating and translating structures. So when you ask about the uh, reference frame, um, I'm really just speaking I'm still speaking just to use all the tools of the, of the 
toy model so far, which is just imagine an ordered set of frames where you've got quasi-particles running around. You've got a kind of discretized background, which is the superposition of all paths that can be taken, which is actually a very dense um, uh, 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 deflation. So when you take the superposition of all possible quasi-crystals that can explain all uh, path integral walks uh, in the energy landscape, then you superimpose all of them, and that's a deflation. So, clearly, right. you're just saying that the, the quasi-crystal background is a reference, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a kind of discretized uh, header, I mean. Yes. Right, header. But it has a remarkably uh, a densified um, deflation, which goes way, way, way below the Planck length. Okay. S sorry if I didn't uh, grasp it. Sorry. Okay. Um, Okay, so the model predicts this rotation and translation for everything, and I am not aware of observational evidence, hard, you know, any hardcore evidence to the contrary. So the shell model allows a large, finite set of density differentials, like the one I showed you was a very small density differential between 1 and 33%, right? But the shell model allows a very large, and finite discrete set of density differentials at some volume of space over some uh, quantity of time because the concentration of order over time can allow 20 groups to be packed very densely. So to explain this, as we grow, as we grow these patterns, we can change we can change the orientation of, we have many choices as we grow this. So as we grow this out to the next shell, we don't have to, we don't have only one choice of shell. And so if you create noisy patterns, um, you can create very noisy patterns that are not going to be the coherent ruled surfaces that will cause meaningful um, patterns. Um, to influence the T over P ratios, patterns of densities of 20 groups. Or you can create very, very orderly patterns over the time domain. And because of such a magnificent quantity happening in our perception of time, where we presume the Planck time, this 10 to the 44, there is a very large set of density differentials in the ordering quality. The order quality is necessary to have the notion of, of force and things meaningful beyond the level of the quantum foam, okay? So this simple illustration of shells to the right does not have the dense distribution of 20 groups in a single frame, but can have extremely dense distribution over multiple frames at the same coordinates in the animation space. Um, so uh, I'm going to have to get to a better uh, illustration to show you something. So let me, okay, so however, the total density over n frames globally has to be conserved. So you can move things around and create little pockets of high pattern, right, over this 10 to the 44, but globally the density is, is roughly conserved. Now, as you go out, you know, compared to 10 Planck moments after the beginning of the universe to now, Okay, now that had a very big difference in 20 groups per shell from the early shells to now. But any shell 1 and 2 now, which are very big, have virtually the same number of, of 20 groups in them. But very, very big shells of some thickness have more 20 groups than smaller radius shells. Yeah, the number is conserved, not the density. The number is roughly conserved. That is, if each 20 group is a quantum energy potential or gravitational well, they are conserved in the animation over n frames or shells, roughly conserved. Their density, their density locally is not conserved and is a fluidic type pattern with density being a key idea. So how dense can it be? Well, it depends on the ratio between your pixel size and the minimum possible distance over time, which is the shell-to-shell -shell distance. So this is also related to the frame rate. So if we were to call this pattern to the right one second, then the density deltas would be possible would be 0 to 5. 
and six for the six shell for the uh, for the six shell measurement. So if a measurement, if in a measurement we label as one second, we have ten to the forty-four frames, then our possible density differentials over the period of that measurement might be something on the order of ten to the forty-four to zero, right? Now, if we set our tetrahedral length to 1 over phi, I, I suspect there should be a limit of how much you can deflate the space of the QSN to place two 20 groups on two sequential shells so closely uh, that they touch or almost touch. And again, this is blurry to a lot of us, but we've been thinking about the QSN incorrectly. The QSN is not the possibility space. The possibility space is, is, think of leaving the QSN tetrahedral lengths intact and then deflating such that the tetrahedra overlap in infinitesimally small distances, right, toward infinity, so that they're already crashing, so you see them crashing, they interpenetrate in the QSN. Now the CQC, the compound quasi-crystal, the 20 groups don't crash. But in the QSN, they crash. But they can crash more and more and more and more, all the way up to infinity, where they just are a superposition again. That, mathematically, is going to have to be our possibility space. Um, so laying down shells is done by selecting from your A, B equals P solution space, where each solution is isomorphic to a relationship selector between the empire window and the projection, or the cut window, I'll call it, that lays down a given shell. So you can project the cut window if you want, or you can just project the empire window if you want. But either way, where you create pattern is by either moving around the empire window inside that boundary and then projecting that, or you can move around the boundary relative, never bumping into the empire window, and then project that. Okay. All right, so at universal scales, the numbers of shift vector choices for one single choice are enormous and allow one to place two shells such that two 20 groups are extremely close together. Let me use this to illustrate. This is the Penrose tiling. So what I've done is I've placed concentric rings to be uh, coincident with the centers of the star decagons, which are uh, projections of half of a five cube to the plane. So notice that as we're close in, um, we have distances that average far apart. And then as we as we go further out, uh, the distances condense. But notice the way that they condense. So this is far, that's similar, that's similar. Ooh, that, that one right there, see the, 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 the red and the blue one? They're really close. That's like a centimeter. And then boom, I go back here to like six centimeters after that. So it's kind of going big, small, big, small, big, small, but, but averaging, averaging closer and closer and closer together. So this might look familiar to you. It may look to you like the discrete spe energy spectra of the hydrogen atom. And in fact, if you take a one-dimensional slice through here and you just make that into spectral lines and then you do a Fourier analysis on that and then you do a Fourier analysis on the spectral lines of hydrogen, you'll realize, oh, okay, so the spectral lines of hydrogen are a quasi-crystal and Freeman Dyson mentioned this, and Montgomery and others. And then you can say, well, do they have anything to do with each other? Is, are the spectral lines of hydrogen, are the, is, are, the Penrose tiling, are the Penrose tiling spectral lines a subset of the spectral lines of hydrogen? Or are the spectral lines of hydrogen a subset of the spectral lines? It turns out that one can say, yes to this within the experimental bounds. 
So you can use the Lehman formula or the Bomber formula. These formulas are based on integers, of course. But you can also use um, these Dirichlet integers here. And so we asked Todd to do so. So I worked on this about three years ago with someone here and then put it down and then asked Todd to take a look at it a few weeks ago and he did some work on it. Um, so the truth is no one can say either way at this point because of the severe experimental limitations. But if you look at it, you would want to know, all right, even if it's not exact, I want to know why, why the spectral lines of hydrogen would correlate so closely to this pattern. And by the way, why are the spectral lines of hydrogen a quasi-crystal, right? So you may adopt a version of the no crash. We might adopt a, a version of the no crashing rule um, to allow uh, the shift vectors to only deflate at a level that allows two 20 groups on two shells to kiss, if that's even possible, or be spaced further apart, but not to interpenetrate. Why? Because allowing crashing introduces new letters. Remember, we're supposed to let the principle of efficient language guide us. And one reasonable discussion that can ensue from the principle of efficient language is that nature is using the most economical code possible to simulate what she is simulating. And in general, two otherwise equal codes where one has a million symbols and a lot of some tactical complexity and the other one has two symbols and much less syntactical complexity, but they're otherwise equal. In general, the one with two symbols and simple complexity is more computationally economical, just as a kind of general concept. So it's vague because I'm saying otherwise equal and I'm not defining what the simulation is and I'm not defining what economical is. But allowing them to crash introduces new lengths, new letters, and it may be preferable to minimize than our letters are length. So it may be preferable to reduce the quantity of ratios that, that are allowed here in this formalism. All right, so why would black holes form? Now for me, it, it should be based only on our two axioms. And in this case, the PEL. And the other axiom, the Pythagorean theorem being true, requires one to adopt as an axiom Euclid's third postulate, which really leads to flat space-time, right? The distance between two points is a straight line, not a curved path. And if you build a network with graph theory out of straight lines, then you're going to get flat two and three and four dimensional spaces. So working with these axioms and thinking about why black holes would form and what black holes are with these little toy tools we're talking about. A 20 group as an energy uh, well that saves a computation and reduces letter counts will cause others, other clocks, uh, to want to be coincident with that location or to be near it. So in other words, think of um, an energy field that's dense and improves the, the probabilities for particles to uh, interact with it and to, to attract to it, to that energy potential. Um, so we can think, all right, so these 20 groups for today are our energy potential. That's the irreducible energy quanta or potential. So all I want to know is how close they can get, be together in time and the ordered set of shells because there is no closeness issue on one shell, right? They're all equally far apart on a given shell. You can only have notions of density of anything from shell to shell. Now, we can't get really high density from shell to shell, but we can get high density of the order magnitude from shell to shell. And it's the order magnitude that, that defines the, the strength of, of the interaction as, as clouds of 20 groups. So, if there were a cloud of high-density 20-group pressure 
clocks would be attracted to it. P pressure here meaning the idea of density, implying the idea of density. But so would photons, presumably. Now both photons and fermions would curve their pathways or arc their discretized paths to follow the principle of efficient language and bend their trajectories towards these high density clouds of 20 groups. Now this toy model for 20 group density or pressure will allow for a form of a black hole where quasiparticles get sucked into it to obey the PEL, to save computation. The no crashing rule will allow them to get remarkably close relative to the distances that other clocks can get to one another. The more of them that get attracted by the PEL into this cloud of ultra-maximal density, the larger the ultra-small compactification of 20-group energy wells will be over the time domain of our shell model, and again, never on a single shell. So each 20-group would have empires emanating from it at that, at that dense object where the emanations drop in density with distance. But if you get many, wow, one over r squared, yeah. But if you get many, 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 many of them um, together, then um, then all those beams coming out would be quite quite dense in space, uh, especially at you know short distances from this limit. So we're talking about a limit, right? I've been I'm touching on ideas why ma we want mathematical reasons, right? So. I, I consider QGR to be mathematicians first, because if we have to put plugs, <coughs> plugs in our proofs, we don't want them at all. We want, we want a physics model that doesn't require any plugs based on observation, that, that, our, that our model from analytical solutions and first principles predicts what we see, both existing known phenomena and, and untested phenomena. All right, so the faster a photon or a clock-based particle is moving away from this black hole, black hole, uh, the easier it will be to get away. But at a certain radius from the ultra dense sphere of 20 groups or clocks at the center of this object, there will be a special phase that relates to the speed of light. So this will be the Schwarzschild radius in your yes. model? Yes. Yeah. So in other words, at that radius, even a particle moving at the speed of light will need to be pulled into the center as required by the PEL. In the shell model, will there be more 20 groups on each successive shell? Yes. <coughs> will it be a meaningful difference? No. Why? Because, for example, a sphere of radius 1 million made of triangles of length 1 has a negligible difference in triangles compared to a sphere of radius 1 million and 1. We talked about that. The 20, group, the 20 groups live on shells the size of the visible universe. My story today is about two things exemplified by this image here. The density of 20 groups in the shell model are different at different parts of the 3 plus 1 space of the animation with two or more frames. In the image, we have density differentials of blue pigments in the fluid medium. The patterns of density flow. They flow, right? They're flowing fluidically and are dynamic in time. The quality of the flow can be oversimplified to overcomplicated but pretty patterns combining rotation and translation. I don't even know what that sentence means. But what it might mean is that the density flows that we would see in the vacuum space around planets and black holes and the, and the flows that we see made of 20 group density differentials from the electromagnetic what, you know, object that we're talking about, this empire wave, it all flows. It, the best analogy is fluidic because at the end of the day, 
all these patterns are, are the product of complicated interactions with this energetic principle of translation and rotation. And even our translate, translation is helical translation. So rotating and translating systems of high density 20 groups over time will instruct the flow how to evolve, how to evolve its off equilibrium flow. And the flow will instruct high systems of rotating and translating 20 groups how to move in an interactive off equilibrium dance between the density flow of 20 groups in this system in the vacuum noise of the QSN and the unorganized or the disorganized quasi particle systems that are in there so you have highly or or organized spaces in vacuum where all you have is the quantum noise but as you get closer and closer to a planet or black hole these Every, you, you've got these clocks, and the clocks are rotating with these beautiful patterns that look like the projection of discretized three spheres, but more beautiful and dynamic than the entire black hole or the entire sun or planet, all these objects rotating and translating to create these emergent uh, density differentials flowing and evolving in some way that must be, it must at least remind one of fluid type of abstract mathematical fluids. All right, so in this system, there is one and only one system that is not op off equilibrium internally. Our version of quantum gravity black holes. So what is the structure of these black holes made of maximally dense 20 groups? I don't know, but I think it's the, the D3 equals A3 lattice. Because with my, with my notion of, of, of deflation, I can get Fong to place 20 groups so close together in shell-by-shell -shell configurations. If I'm giving her enough freedom by the deflation concept, that without breaking any, without any harsh mathematical plugs, she can get 20 groups very, very close together, but you have to allow her to create a very fine scale deflation structure so that she can connect that closeness up to actual objects in E8, right? So if you wanted to get one 20 group here from one object that it maps to in E8, and then you wanna get another one so close it's kissing, all you have to do is just go to a shift vector that does that, and boom, you can do it. So, so if we had a no crashing principle, because of the PEL doesn't want new lengths, the PEL hates new ratios. If we had that, then the closest you could possibly get the 20 groups together is the FCC lattice configuration. It's not a quasi-periodic construction as their densest, and it's not, and it's not, um, it's, it's, it's the A3 equals D3 lattice. And that is the limit. It's not, a, it's not a zero singularity. It's more like a limit in loop quantum gravity formalisms where it's a remarkably dense over time domain pattern of, of these clocks. And they have, they have empire, they all have empire, they can all have empires when they're the emperor, right? So if everybody gets a turn to be the emperor from time to time, then there's gonna be a lot of empires over the time domain. All right, so to summarize, relate both density and the curvy fluidic flow of density evolution that I describe as different magnitudes of of a quantity that we'll label as curvature. Because again, all of the pattern, all of the objects describing the, em the flows of empire patterns are all rotating and translating. And they interact. So these flow patterns interact. And the interaction of a bunch of rotating and translating fields creates generalized fluid behavior. So some regions are more curvy than others. I mean, 
This is virtually a laminar flow, and you have other areas that are far more curved. And so not only do you have curvature differentials in this concept of fluid, but you also have density differentials, right? D density of the blue pigments in the, in, in the water. All right. So why would the net curvature be predicted to be zero in this toy model story? And by the way, the toy model doesn't predict um, average curvature. I'm just saying that I think it is because there's some good cosmological evidence nowadays that the average curvature uh, may very well be, f no, flat. So I'm saying if that's true, if those observation-based arguments uh, in astrophysics are true, then, uh, then why would the net curvature in our discussion here uh, also try to predict um, flatness? So this isn't literal curvature of, of the space. It's, it's the curvature of the organizational patterns which instructs the particles how to move and curve and arc. So, so because the quantity of 20 groups per shell over n shells is about the same, any notion of flow density, curvature, quasi-particles, black holes, etc., in this view is the quality of the ordered sets of a roughly conserved shell-to-shell -shell quantity of quantum energy wells as 20 groups. So that the, the, if you just take this moment and then this moment, right? Of course, the universe increased in radius from that time, but over both moments, the, you know, reduced all the way down to Planck moments and put into these shells, had the same quantity, more or less, of these quantum energy wells. So gravity drops as 1 over r squared, but starts off weaker. Electrostatic force drops as 1 over r uh, squared, but, drop, but starts off stronger. And then the magnetic force drops as 1 over r cubed, but starts off stronger. And so, remember the 30 rays coming out from each emperor, Fibonacci chains of 20 groups that go to the end of the universe. So they drop like this. They drop as 1 over r squared. They're linear. They're, they have nothing, they have very little to do uh, as, as a Fibonacci chain of 20 groups with the beautiful curvy surfaces of the EM field made of 20 groups. So that should drop as 1 over r squared. Uh, let, me come, let me come back to charge and first, I'll come back to charge, but I'm going to go down here and, and, and talk about why the, the magnetic force would drop as 1 over r3 in this model. So this force is defined by a spherical clock that, cir that circulates right, and propagates. And from that picture I showed you from the quantum mechanical simulation in a computational physics back that looked like discretized hop fibers pr projected to R3, um, this field has a, has a, it's made of objects that are linearly going out and dropping as 1 over R squared. But the ruled surfaces are forming these density patterns where they get very close on these lines perpendicular and at an angle to, um, to these linear lines that come out. They're very dense, they're very strong, they're very dense because of all of the cycles pumped into the clock cycle. So think about how this is meant to kind of give you a visual tool to think about the shell model. So, so the magnetic force would sort of be like, let me see if I, would sort of be like if you had, if you had, a, if you had something touching this surface of things that are spherical, like, like around a magnetic field, it's a curved surface, so the way it would interact with small with planes with particles on it 
would not be like this. So, Ray, you might have a comment on this because we talked, to, chatted a bit about this uh, a couple days ago about how your rationale on why the 1 over r squared, when you square that or when you multiply that, you get the 1 over r cubed. Do you want to try to add to this? Uh, oh, yes, yes. To get the 1 over r cubed from the 1 over r2, you just have to use dipoles. And then by the difference between the two fields in 1 over r2, it will give a field in 1 over r3. Uh, yeah, it's like a derivative. Sorry? The like a derivative. Yes, the derivative, yes. So it's just uh, replacing the center of it's the field the by a, a dipole. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to. I'm no, going. Why, yeah. Sorry. Yes. Why do you say gravity drop says 1 over r squared, the static force drop says 1 over r squared, and the other one? I don't understand what. Um, yeah, the, the, the gravity force exists. Uh, due to what and the electrostatic force due to what because those are true for for uh, point masses or point particles it's not so uh, what is, is what is this force i mean uh, i thought this was produced by by what maybe i'm wrong but this isn't true that gravity no drops is one over r squared no, is so there any absolutely model? not i mean it's it's gravity drops as one over r squared when it's produced by a point mass the same for the electrostatic force. If you, if you take the dipole, the electric field of a dipole at a long distance drops as 1 over r, over r cube. If you take a strange configuration of charges, there is no reason why this should drop as 1 over r square. If you take a plate, it is constant. So it's 1 over r, r, r squared if it's the field generated by a point object. So what is the point object here? I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm just speaking about our clocks in general. I'm saying that the clocks have rays that come out and drop as 1 over r squared. So I'm not as familiar with the, you know, with the physics no, no, evidence. I mean, but because those statements are true uh, for point objects. Otherwise, well, they're I, false. I, I'm just saying that in this model, the, 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 the fundamental mass would have this thing called empire rays that come out and drop as 1 over r squared. So I don't so regard that as a point object or a point particle. Because otherwise, if it had an internal structure, there would be no reason why that should go that way. Why not? Because well, it would be okay as a, at a, at a sufficient well, if distance, you take a dipole. as long as the, as long as the um, ah, internal if you structure. Take, uh, so, sorry, if you take a, a, a water molecule, yeah. okay, even at, at long distances, it would drop as 1 over our, our cube. Not one over r squared. So that's, that's for charge. So that's you for to, you have to that's for charge. That's symmetry. Yeah, you but that's to... for charge. Sorry. What, the sentence you said that's for charge, not gravity. I'm talking about now the electrostatic force. Yeah, yeah. But I. So the second uh, statement. I, same thing for gravity. About gravity. The gravity is the same thing. Exactly the same thing. It's the same thing. So it's similar, except that with gravity, you don't have dipoles. Right. So if you have if you have monopolar charges, then if the distance is large enough compared to the size of the charge distribution. Yes, but you still might have a, a configuration which is not symmetrical around the center. And for that configuration, there is no reason why it should go as 1 over r squared. You can walk this. Can see well, it should approximately go there. Well, approximately. So they will have quadrupole moments and octopole moments. Yeah, but how about the electrostatic force then? Uh, wait, wait, guys, guys, it's not, it, 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 there's only one emperor at one time, and the emperor has the rays. So it's like a point. So my clocks, right, the emperor is at one position at a given time and only one. And that guy has 30 Fibonacci chain beams coming out of it that have these, these quanta of gravity, these 20 groups on it. So that does roughly drop as one over r squared, but it changes its position around in there. Yes, there's a little wobble in there. But overall, even at that Planck scale, if you take the wobble of it moving around, Overall, it's still going to be shooting out these empire rays per frame at 30 per frame that drop is 1 over r squared. Now, now that's easier to explain than charge, right? Now, the, there, should be a, there, should, there should be a big difference between the organized part of my empire wave field that runs in line 
with the axis of propagation versus another type of field that is perpendicular. So um, it, because the clock pattern is, is cycling like on a two sphere, okay, it's creating this dense over time pattern that has components that go like this, layer, just like this, and that are kind of moving, have an angle to them as well. And the densest part of that should be right here perpendicular to this. And then that blends off and blends off. And as you get to this portion, there should be this special portion here that never, that pinches off almost perfectly, but not quite, and that you have this strand. So you have a Gaussian-like distribution and then a strand near the Compton wavelength that just keeps going. And then you have to say, well, wait a minute, if you've got this noisy background and you've got all these other particles around you and most experimental setups, then how often per, at 10 to the 44 time changes per second, how often is the orientation of this pole, this strand of 20 groups coming all the way out to the end of the universe, how often does that change? Well, it constantly changes. Fit particles interacting with the background and with the background energy potentials and the other energy potentials all around it, a free electron would be constantly, constantly changing at an incredibly high frame rate, such that it would look experimentally like a spherical charge. But you could get them to align if you relate them in a current because the principle of efficient language would require one charge, one of these pole, dipoles to orient with another and another and, and self-organize around a similar T over P ratio and a similar direction and feed off of each other's um, wake, like the wake of a boat, right? They feed off of each other's empires. But other than in current, we should expect that the charge, that these charges are constantly changing orientation, creating a kind of spherical field around them, but it's combined with the magnetic field that is very different looking, right? The magnetic field is just more covers, you know, when you freeze it, the magnetic field is covering most of the area with the, with the charge portion here, but the charge portion keeps changing its orientation just due to interactions. So somehow this field, the electrostatic force, is some kind of combination. I don't know. Maybe the electrostatic force is 1 over r squared because it's just these beams coming out that are moving around so fast for free electrons that, it, that you can model it as a spherical charge. Again, I apologize to some of my other concepts starting very early. I'm very confident on the reasonableness, the logical consistency. This section on gravity, it's brand new for me, and I don't want to represent it as anything other than food for thought to keep, to keep thinking, because we're not going to try to get into gravity here for a while. We have to develop electron self-interaction <laughs> before two particle. We need just electron self-interaction. We need a Compton wavelength. We got to get these clocks right. Um, so our quantum wave function... There are a discontinuity between the first discussion with the, this discussion. Okay. A discontinuity between yeah. the first discussion and yes. the... Yes. The, yes. Argument, the argument with the quantum mechanics and now with large gravity, yeah. how to connect. Right. So I don't have the connections very well, but I do... The only thing I wanted to impress upon you today is my notion that without... without without me assuming space-time needs to be um, curved, all I need is to assume that particles around strong gravitational fields curve their trajectories and follow geodesic paths. But, as you well know, successful electromagnetic mo uh, formalisms also use geodesics and predict the curves without saying that the space-time is curved. So you don't have to assume curved space-time in order to model curved paths, geodesic-like paths. Um, and furthermore, I have this idea of density and fluid 
as very general ideas on how I would expect for gravity to be. Gravity would relate, a quantum gravity must relate to notions similar to, to density, density of or organization over time, and off equilibrium flow, all the way down to very small scales where you would get little vortices that you could relate to gravity. So, and somehow those have to converge and the same principles and objects, uh, the same potentials the, uh, for the gravitational and electromagnetic quanti you know, quantized qu with quantum principles in both has to be unified. So anyway, a couple slides away from the end. So our quantum wave function has a component along the axis of the elliptical wave form that extends to infinity. And this corresponds to the dipole of the fermion which has empires running in line with the path of the, part of the part quasi particle. Um, and so that, that should constantly move around. There's no reason it won't constantly change its direction. It's like, it's, that little dipole is like a free magnet in a competing and dynamical field of other uh, force, uh, magnetic forces and it will, con it will constantly change its orientation uh, over uh, minute time scales and allow you to model it roughly as a, as a spherical charge. That, yeah, that would drop in density um, like one over r squared. And so something about the magnetic field dropping as one over r cubed has, has to be explained better. I think. Uh you have, so you have a sense of Fibonacci string bits, and you can, from those, you can define some type of graviton, discretized graviton. And then if you can explain coherent states of such gravitons, you should be able to get GR, like that one. We can use that anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, so this is the last slide, guys. Yeah. <laughs>